your town, my town, any town in the USA. Peace, tranquility. In the early dawn, the milkman makes his rounds, the only activity in a sleepy world. The early risers prepare to face a new day. All along the block, there is a faint stir. Yes, this could be your town, my town. Special Agent Bill Baxter. I'm Special Agent Fenton. The destruction of the beautiful building you just witnessed resulted when an honest citizen refused to cooperate with gangsters. Now, unfortunately, this happens to the peace, the tranquility, and the security of a nation when hoodlums take over. Gangsters strike when the odds are against law officers. In this Kansas City apartment are two men who live by the creed that guns don't argue. At the right is Adam Rochetti and his girlfriend, Hope. Also, Charles Arthur Pretty Boy Floyd, killer and machine gun expert. And his friend... One? You know, I always take two. Oh. Who's this big shot, Vern Miller? He's a smooth operator. He knows what he's doing. What's he want with you and Pretty Boy? He wants us to help spring Frank Nash. Easy for a big job he's got framed. Who's Frank Nash? You know, dames ask too many questions. Now listen. When Miller gets here, I want you two to get lost. You understand? Come on, Paula. Check the train. We have exactly one hour. Now let's look at it again. Federal men are bringing them in. They always go through the freight depot to get away from the crowds. Now I'll park there. You two in the truck there. And up pops me and Rochetti. They fork over Nash, or we open up with our choppers. That's the general idea. We'll just cover the local boys, right? Mm -hmm. Feds ain't even allowed to carry guns. If they get tough, we'll slap them on the wrist. <laughs> Bill, you'll be working on that stack when I get back. <laughs> it could be. You want me to go with you? Oh, thanks, but my big brother isn't going to hold my hand on my first assignment. Not after all my sweating to get into your beloved FBI. Is this Frank Nash dangerous? Yes, he is. Bank robber. Expert safe cracker, among other things. But well, we've got him now. All handcuffed and ready for the judge. Well, I've got to go. I'll pick up Shelby in five minutes. Honey, you just keep stuffing him. See you later. Young Baxter and a companion met city officers to prepare for the arrival by train of fellow agents bringing the criminal Frank Nash to face trial in federal court. Miller, Floyd, and Machete were on schedule for the rescue of their friend, Nash. The officers went over their assignments. Miller, trying not to arouse any suspicion, cautiously approached the hiding place of his companions. Car parking in back of that city car. Hasn't got special plates. Must be the feds. Feds, huh? Don't worry about them. Those city cops ain't helpless. Them pop guns they got will be of no use. Can the chatter. They'll be bringing Frank any minute. The three of us can do it and get away? Four. Frank will have a chopper as soon as he pry him loose. Get ready. The police went to their posts. Here comes a fed. We'll take Nash. I don't move. Calm down. Hey, 
You trigger happy bums. You got Frank. You got the whole bunch. Let's get out of here. Let's go, Joe. In the confusion of the massacre, Frank Nash was also killed, and the criminals made their escape. Repeat, men. We of the FBI no longer are merely fact finders. We will be armed. Well, now, what do you think of that? That's great. At last, Chief. It took the tragedy in Kansas City to do it, but Congress is convinced. No longer will we face hoodlums unarmed. You will become experts with the machine gun, the rifle, the automatic shotgun, the pistol, and the tear gas gun. Let's go, Chief. Well, it can't be too soon for me, sir. Gentlemen, your training will begin immediately. Sir, again, I request assignment to the Kansas City case. Yes, Baxter, I... I expected you would. Through methodical checking, Agent Baxter learned that Paula was Pretty Boy's favorite. Believing there was a chance she might lead him to the slayers of his brother, Baxter passed himself off as a free-spending hood from the West Coast. Paula was lonely, for Pretty Boy had skipped town. But the blonde was cautious. Texas was having its troubles with a notorious couple, and the governor, a woman, called for Captain Stewart of the Rangers. Clyde Barrow was a vicious killer, matched only by his sweetheart, Bonnie Parker. Together, these two were murder. In five weeks, they committed 18 crimes. They attended a country dance, and when the sheriff walked over to tell him not to park in a certain spot, they killed him. They stole the car, and when the owner protested, they killed him. In Missouri, six policemen closed in on them. Machine gun fire killed three and wounded two others. As they fled and crashed a roadblock, they killed three more. A typical ruthless, senseless murder was that at Butcher's Music Store, which had been cased by Raymond Hamilton. Sorry, but a hundred's the smallest I've got. I'll get the change. It's all about it. They hit hard and fast. They killed their witnesses, and as the murder list mounted, so did the anger of the nation. I want those two rattlesnakes stomped on. It's your assignment. You're on leave from the Rangers until the job is finished. Understand? I reckon so, Governor. Stomp hard. Pick your own crew, men who know how to shoot. Well, you know, most cops know how to shoot, but oftentimes they hesitate a bit before pulling the trigger, especially on a woman. Bonnie Parker is a psychopathic killer. She doesn't hesitate. You're so right, but that's a whole rub. They know that cops don't want to kill. So that's why they get in the shots. And policemen die. Captain Stewart, you've got a fine record. Hundreds of arrests and many criminals who've tried to shoot it out with you and failed. You're making me out another wild Bill Hickok. Score of dead men prove that you're the man to handle this Beryl Parker outfit. Those criminals use the state lines for protection. That's why they keep moving. Captain Stewart, I know you need authority to cross the state lines. But I can't give you that authority. I realize that. But there's lots of governors that feel as you do. I'll bet you could just talk them in about most anything. Like what, Captain Stewart? Oh, like deputizing a non-residence as a special investigator for the Parker Barrow case, and maybe if you, uh, talk real good, they might agree to a text. In the next few weeks, I organized a statewide manhunt. It paid off in the capture of Ray Hamilton. Clyde Barrow had lost his most able lieutenant. 
They've tried him for everything in the book. After conviction and numerous charges, Ray Hamilton received prison sentences that totaled 263 years. Ooh, the rest of his life in the pen. I'd rather die. Ten times. Ray's not going to spend the rest of his life in no cage, Bonnie. Look, Clyde. I know he's your friend, but don't be crazy. Ray's been sent to the Eastern Prison Farm. Nobody's ever crashed out of that place. They didn't have us to help him. I've got friends on the inside. One of them is a trustee. We're going to get Ray out, understand? We're going to get him out if we have to kill every god on that farm. Contact had been made at the Eastham Prison Farm. Plans were passed on and weapons were smuggled in. Clyde and Bonnie were right on schedule. They stopped their car on a road that paralleled the prison camp. The guards were suspicious, but it was a public highway. A car could have engine trouble. The guards were well armed, and there was that charged fence. Clyde Barrow had no nerves. He made sure of the right moment, the split second that would give him and Bonnie the edge. Freeze! was a success, but the ruthless murdering of guards and convicts alike was the beginning of the end for Clyde and Bonnie. Even the men they helped to escape were horrified at the slaughter. They made the state line together, but Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker were soon to find out that they were completely alone. Wait, Ray. What are you guys rushing for? We're across the state line. I guess we're anxious to get rid of these clothes. Yeah, well, there's a complete change of clothes for both of you in the other car. What's wrong? You guys haven't said ten words since we broke you out. You and Bonnie did a lot of shooting back there, Clyde. What'd you expect us to do, throw spitballs? A lot of cons died. Some of them were friends. Tell Palmer to meet Red at Max's Cafe Friday at 2. We'll pick you up at the hideout later. I've dug up a list of the men Barrows work with. Checked out the addresses of girlfriends and close relatives. Only one rang a bell. Scully Wass. Hey, Wass. Hello, Mr. Barrows. Miss Parker. Nice day. Where's Ray? Uh, Mr. Hamilton? Well, I haven't seen him in since uh, in a long time. Oh, you're lying. If Ray isn't here, he left a message. No, no, I swear I haven't seen him. Please. First red and Palmer will show up at Max's and now this. What the devil's going on? Plain enough. The yellow punks have run out. No. No. Maybe Red and Palmer, but not Ray. Not like this, not without a word. Ray's probably been delayed somehow. But he'll show up in a day or so. Mr. Barra, I wish you wouldn't use my place anymore. It's too dangerous. He's afraid of us, Clyde. Look at him shake. I did it only because my son asked me to. Oh, I didn't mean to have him to use my place. All right, skip it. We'll be busy for a day or so anyway. Well, Ray will contact you. Well, where will I tell him to meet you? Where will you be? You just drive down the road to Gippsland Sunday afternoon. We'll meet you somewhere along the line. Bring Ray or bring his message. But be on that road in your truck Sunday. Uh. Ray Hamilton didn't contact Wass, but I did. And I found him to be completely cooperative. Wass had heard the story of the Eastham prison break and where he had helped Clyde and Bonnie before he now hated and feared them. He told us other plans to meet him on the Gibson Road the coming Sunday. 
This was a break we had long been waiting for. But of course, I ain't going to drive down there to meet him. On the contrary, Mr. Wass, we want you to. Now, about three miles down the road, look for a pasteboard box in the middle of it. When you see it, stop. And pretend to repair a flat tire. Sunday afternoon, Wash started out in his truck. Following our instructions, he stopped at the box and began to fake a flat tire. Captain Stewart? Captain Stewart? Are you here? It's okay, Mr. Wash. Go right ahead. The decoy in the road was not in an enviable spot. But the brush at the sides of the road was laced with armed deputies. All were in position, tensely waiting and under orders to take no chances with the killers in the ambush set up by the ranger captain. Wass knew that he was bait for a dangerous trap. But the old man was playing his part perfectly. Here they come, men. Stay covered now and don't take any chances. Where's Ray? What's wrong? Bonnie's pulled her last trigger. Are oh, they both? Yeah. Clyde Barron and Bonnie Parker are yesterday's headlines. Statistics in a closed file. Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker serve one good purpose. Their crimes resulted in laws which stopped criminals from using state borders to escape. The training we received was thorough in all phases. It takes a good man to survive the course. It misses nothing. Learning that we had traced them to their hideout in Buffalo, New York, Floyd and his pals were heading for Ohio, where relatives of Rachetti owned a farm. The occupants were unhurt, but the car was in need of repairs, and the girls were ordered to go back to town for a mechanic. Pretty Boy and Rossetti left the highway to hide and wait. Paula and Hope had a sure plan for hitching a ride, if a man was driving. Really, that's dangerous. Depends on how you look at it. You stopped, didn't you? It's true that it's a lucky day for both of us. Climb in. Thanks. Uh, is that your car back on the curb? Yeah, we're going for a tow truck. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a warning from the sheriff's office. Pretty Boy Floyd and Adam Rochetti are reported in this vicinity. It is believed Floyd and his pal Rochetti are accompanied by two girls, one blonde and one brunette. Let's get some music. Hello, operator? 
Give me the FBI. Quick. Let's go. Floyd's been pinpointed on Highway 7. This could be it. Maybe they ditched him. That'll be the day. Besides, they know what happened to Vern Mill in Detroit. Yeah. Just the same, I'm getting jumpy. They have been gone a long time. Maybe that's them now. It could be anybody. Hold it, Ricciotti. You're covered. Keep in. Don't shoot. Come on, drop it. Drop it. Lloyd, come on with your hands up. All right, I'm coming in after you. Look out, bud. He'll give up the hard way. That's shut up. But the others will be here any minute. He won't keep. I'm going in after him. I right, move. Lloyd, this is it. Yeah? Well, come and get it. Okay, tough guy. I'm still with you. Yeah? Well, I'm gonna get the one Z-man anyway. Well, Russ, I guess this account is closed. The women were released after questioning. It was believed Paula and Hope might unknowingly lead the FBI to other wanted men. Wow, what a saxophone. Make way for a music lover. Crime breeds crime, and one gang of outlaws is linked to another. In the Middle West, there was a church-going woman with four sons. And to make certain her fierce pride in them would be justified, she taught them all she knew. There was a robbery this morning at 2 o'clock. Where were you? Oh, Ma, I'm too old. 2 o'clock? Where were you? Uh, I was playing pool at the Royal Pool Room. The Royal closes at 1. Now, when you know how to use your brains quick, then you'll be old enough to stop the lessons. If I'd been a cop asking you for an alibi, you'd be on your way to the pen. Uh, I know. I'm sorry, Ma. Time to get up anyway. Put your blue suit on. It's Sunday. Do we have to go to church? I swear I've raised a bunch of fools. You and Herman have both been let off for stealing because of your Sunday school records. Judges are impressed by those things. So it's only smart, Fred. Smart. Okay, Ma. Okay. Oh. Coffee on? Ready when you are. By the way, ain't it time for Herman to be home? It is. He's messed up this job. I'll sure make him sorry. Take it easy on him, Ma. Herm's only a kid. And after the way you wrote him the last time he got caught... Don't worry about Herman. You've got a job of your own to do. Tomorrow. Herm back yet? He ain't coming back. After sensational chase by two police officers, Herman Barker crashed his car, then turned his gun on himself before the police could reach him. Oh, no, not Herm. 
dirty, lousy cops. But why do you have to shoot himself, Ma? Why? It was only a robbery charge. He lost his nerve, that's why. Correction. Little Herman was killed by you, my dear wife. Me? Why, you old... You, his mother. You drove him to do the jobs. You frightened him with fear of failure to the place that he chose death rather than face you. Now, I don't blame him a bit. You wordy old buzzard. They're my sons, and I'll handle them. Go ahead. I'm only the stepfather. Besides, you're doing so well by them. One son dead, two more in jail, and another one headed the same way. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Ma, what about Herman? I'll call the mortuary later. Let me take care of that. You have to go over the plan for that job. You mean you want me to go ahead with it? Now? After... Certainly you go ahead with it. Don't tell me you're losing your nerve. No. Of course not, Ma. I'll do it. Good. Now let's have some breakfast or we'll be late for church. He pulled the job and several more. Was apprehended, tried, convicted, and sentenced to Kansas State Penitentiary. Ma Barker kept up a constant bombardment of letters trying to get her son's parole. Doc was paroled from a life sentence at one penitentiary, while Fred was being paroled from Kansas State. Ma planned everything in minute detail. The location of the bank, the adjoining grocery store, the hardware, the dime store. When I planned that West Plains job, I told you to get rid of the stolen car. But Ma, Al said... Al disobeyed orders. An officer got curious, and you killed him. That was okay, but you put us on the run. In my outfit, no liquor and no dames. What about him? He guzzles by the gallon. I, my vicious and callous young killer, am dry behind the ears. Someday that long tongue of yours will get us caught. Beat it, Arthur. Your servant. Boys, we're moving to St. Paul. Crops were good, and there's cash in the banks thereabouts. What about old bourbon dress? For once, I agree with you, Alvin. A pickled tongue is a bad risk. Pa Barker believed travel broadened prospects for her vicious brood. Frequent change of scenery, lessened chances of their being pinpointed, making it difficult for police. Ma was methodical, even when taking a useless member of her family on a goodbye ride. If she ever had any regrets, Ma was not one to permit sentiment to interfere. Arthur was unaware his taste for liquor was blotting him out. He was Ma's husband. She had vowed till death do us part. What are the shovels for? Just gonna bury some evidence. You help. Oh, you know I can't dig my, my arthritis. Supervise. Oh. You know I can't trust those boys alone. Well, would it do any good to refuse? What do you think? How big a hole do we need? That's a good question. I got the answer. Well, where's the evidence? Lay down. I want to measure. Now, listen, son. Lay down. Go on, stretch out. Hey, what's the idea? Mark his feet. Oh, you got no call to do this. I never listened to my voice again, either of you. Double up. Huh? Go on. That's better. Poor Arthur. <laughs> How come you wasted so much ammunition? Al, get in and hurry up. We want to get to St. Paul by night. 
Doc Barker joined them in St. Paul, and the gang struck rapidly and successfully. Using submachine guns, they traced a bloody trail in Minnesota. As a planner and caser of jobs, Ma Barker had no equal. Ma, Al, I just got the word. Guess who wants to join us on a big job? Who wants to join us? Probably some two-bit hood. Wrong. Dillinger. Dillinger. Not only him, but Babyface Nelson, Dan Meter, and Green. They want Ma to pick the job and plan it. How about it, Ma? Later. I got other plans. But it'd be unnatural. We're leaving the bank business. Temporarily. As of now, we're kidnappers. Kidnappers? Are you crazy? Up to now, only the state and local cops are looking for us. As long as we stay out of their jurisdiction. The FBI. College boys. Get one of them in front of a machine gun. His hide's no tougher than the local laws. Mom's right. The gang wasted no time or effort. A big job confronted agents Baxter and Avery. I wonder who's pulled this job. Could be any of a half dozen gangs, including the Barkers. It's possible. But I'd rule out the Barkers on the grounds they've never gone in for kidnapping. Is the family paying the ransom? With marked bills. Sooner or later, those will start showing up. And wherever they show up, so will we. Ma sent her boys on a second kidnapping before the agents made any headway on the first. The victim was snatched right off the street by Fred and Al Carcass. Doc drove the car. The second victim was certain the gang had refueled from a five-gallon can. The can had been thrown away. We figured 15 miles per gallon times the 16-gallon capacity of the kidnapped car and set the need for gas within 240 miles. Teams of searchers went to the 240-mile radius to search back to the city. The fingerprints gave us our first break. At this point, we were not hunting the Barker gang. We were hunting kidnappers, identities unknown. No doubt about it. Perfect match. Doc Barker, convicted of attempted robbery and murder, sentenced to life imprisonment, now out on parole. Doc Barker, out on parole. Fred Barker, out on parole. Alvin Carpus, out on parole. They're all parolees except Ma. Ma. That's what I call my mother. Well, don't get sentimental about this one. It could kill you. I've chosen the Security National Bank. It'll be our biggest and most successful, if we do it as planned. Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, Homer Van Meter will do the inside job. Dillinger will enter here, take the manager to each teller, collect the cash, and rob the vault. Nelson will stand here and stand the customers in the bank guard against this wall. Eddie Green in the first car will be parked here. I'll be here in the second. We'll have five machine guns, plenty of ammunition. Use them only if necessary. Now we'll scatter. Meet on March 6th in Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls saw a good example of Ma Barker's split-second methods. At 10.30, Al Carpus, pushing a baby buggy that cradled a Tommy gun, set the pace. Twelve seconds later, car number one was at the intersection to jockey into position. Nine seconds later, Carpus reached the front of the bank. Three more seconds, and Dillinger, Babyface, and Van Meter were entering the bank. It was only a fraction over a minute from the start of the operation. Fred got out of the car and walked to his post.
16 seconds later, Doc took his station, and Ma's last pawn was in place. Ma could congratulate herself. The plan was right on schedule. But the most deliberate calculations can be tilted by the unpredictable. This unforeseen hazard called for a new move. to a sticky bun, the curious clustered at the sound of the excitement. All right, take it easy, folks, and nobody gets hurt. Everything's under control here, John. Take your time. These cold-blooded operators were equal to the situation. Calmly, they held a major portion of Sioux Falls at bay as they continued Ma's strategy. You, and you, inside the car. With hostages herded into the cars, the well-drilled gang had a shield against too close pursuit. The odds favored their getaway. It was a clean one. Ma Barker had scored again. The hostages were released unharmed. The money split. The Barkers said goodbye to the Dillinger bunch and returned to St. Paul. By car, train, bus, and even plane, authorities ran down hundreds of tips. One was red hot. The Barkers and Carpus were reported in Chicago. Agents Baxter and Avery moved in. I wish Al was here. You know the rules. No liquor and no dames. Al, break them both. I'm jittery. The town's crawling with cops. Stoolies are tipping me every time I show my nose. Al, why don't we move south? You're forgetting about Fred and Ma. Well, maybe it's time to forget them. Bessie? Yeah. Al, I just got the word. This town's hot because of you. What else is new? This is federal heat. They just drove in town less than 10 minutes ago. Oh, those lousy feds. I better phone Fred and Ma. I'll get suitcases. Maybe I ought to stick around and kill a few. Not in my house. Beat it. Nah. Beat it. Oh, go on, on. Get your lousy hands go off on me. Go on, I'll pay you on your way. Hurry up with the suitcases, Shirley. Let's go. I gotta phone Fred and Ma. Oh, let him take their own chances. We had approached the hideout silently and cautiously. But before we were ready to spring our trap, a local squad car passed with siren waving. It was a bad break for us. Hello. What? Hello, Ma. Hey, man. What? I'm making a run for it. Good luck. Grab the bags. G-Man, closing in on Al. They got nothing on you. You stay here. Bessie will take care of you. I'll get in touch with you. We missed Alvin Carpus by seconds. He had rehearsed his getaway, but before we could block the tunnels, he was gone. We were closing in. We had him on the run. He was never going to stop running. I'm waiting here for my girl to get back, and I'm not stirring until she does. You always were a fool. Like you said, Ma, it's a big town. Good luck, Doc. I'll see you, Fred. Detectives knocked on many doors and asked questions. The city wasn't as big as Doc thought, and a positive identification was made. Less than two weeks later, the agents found Doc and made the capture without a struggle.
One down and two to go. Listen to this. Believe me, the Florida weather is great. I read and sleep while Fred fishes or goes up to feed old Joe. An alligator, one of the places, keeps as a tourist attraction. Et cetera, et cetera. Signed, your loving ma. P.S. Be sure and burn this. Where's the envelope? I did like ma said. Still narrows down to one state. Yeah, but that's a lot of state to hide in. Not when there's a tourist attraction like an alligator named Old Joe. Now, this should be a breeze. Dr. Gelfi in? I'm sorry. He can't be disturbed. By me, baby, he can be disturbed. Dr. Lutz word that he's not seeing anyone. If you care to make a proper appointment. You got spunk. But I'm still going to see him. Anything wrong, nurse? Hello, Walt. A long time. I was just trying to tell this. Uh, it's, it's, it's all right, uh, miss. I, 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 I'll... The doc means he'll see me. Something wrong? Who is he? He looks familiar. Forget it. You've never seen him. Remember? You've never seen him. Do I detect a hole in the welcome mat? Oh, no. no, of course not, Al. I'm glad to see you. You look fine. Just fine. Yeah, a liar by the clock. I look like the devil. And you'd a lot rather see him than me. Oh, uh, Shirley, this is Dr. Walter Gelfi, our host. Delighted, my dear. Hmm. I've always said that Al shows wonderful taste. I wonder what you really say about me. Only the best, Al. That's enough, Doc. Al, you, uh, you said host. Uh, well, I'd like to be, but I'm afraid I can't. A few hours, maybe, but... You'll be our host as long as I want you to. And a good host. If you're not, then I'll give you a reason to be afraid. Let's get things straight. I know you read the paper. You know I'm hot, plenty hot. But Al, this is federal heat. Cops are cops. I'm sick and tired of everybody going green and starting to shake when you talk about G-men. G-men. Feds. What are they, some special creation? Sure, they got the heat on me, but they haven't got me. And they won't get me either. I'll cut them down like rag dolls. Al Carpet, understand? Al Carpet! You want the whole town to hear? Take it easy, honey. Take it easy. <sighs> yes, uh huh? Yes, we'll call you tomorrow at four. Goodbye. Cancel all your patients for a week. Cancel? Well, I can't. For 20 grand, you cut your mother's heart out. will give me one you'll love. Maybe he'll make me as pretty as he is. <laughs> it's a big order, Al. I've done little plastic surgery, but a completely new face. I don't know. You better know. Oh, 
Okay. So maybe I can change the face enough, but the fingerprints, those just can't be changed. Then cut them off. Hell, you're crazy. It won't work. You cheap pill pusher. I'm getting tired of your stalling. Get ready to operate, doctor. Tonight. Nurse. I can't operate without a nurse. Shirley? From now on, you're his nurse. Tell her what to do. Oh, look, I don't know anything about nursing. I'm going to be sick as a horse. Tell it to him. He's running the show. You think you'll be okay? I'm a pretty good doctor, but I'm no magician. Get it over with, Walt. Just like that? Just like that. For a fast job. Can't do too much. Add a few lines in the cheeks here. Cut away some of the chin. Don't draw a diagram of my blood. Just do it. Okay, I'll finish the face tonight. And the fingers. But hell, it's a lot of cutting. Be a devil of a shock for you. It works. Now. Relax, Al. Let's see, it's mighty fast. A matter of seconds. In case the doc makes a mistake, blow his brains out for me. So quick? So quick. Big man. Tough killer. How much is Carpus worth dead? You better get busy, Doc. If Carpus doesn't come out of this, you wind up with all of his loot. Must be quite a lot. Not enough. Still, it'll all be yours. No strings. No more hiding. No more running away. No more putting up with old creepy. We could... Uh... Doc, if Al knocks on those pearly gates, you'll be hanging on his coattail. Avery soon admitted he had underestimated Florida. In the next few weeks, they checked on the names of a thousand alligators. None was identified as being Old Joe. Not until Baxter and Avery reached Lake Weir. They found the right gator, and better yet, a woman who remembered the faces of Ma Barker and Fred. She said they were renting a cottage on the point. The agents knew well it was dangerous to go alone but they didn't want to give the Barkers any time to slip away. Thought you were going to read, Ma. What? All of a sudden, I got the jumps. Ma's intuition was giving her a straight tip. Agents Baxter and Avery had arrived. Alone, the agents knew they couldn't rush the Barkers. Cover and concealment was scarce around the cottage. One side backed by water. Moving in was a slow, awkward, bruising process. I feel cops around me. Cops? <laughs> Ma, you're getting old. They're still looking for us in St. Paul. Son, they're looking for us everywhere. Baxter, you think they'll fight? As long as I have any breath left. Ma, will you stop with the feet? You're driving me nuts. There's cops around me. This feeling's never been wrong yet. Oh, for the love of Pete, you got cops on the brain. Take a look for yourself. There's no cops. Oh, you're right. No, Ma, they're all over. Stop devil and uncover the front. But we can't fight them. We don't have a chance. You yellow pup. We're not giving up to a bunch of cops. If they take us, they're going to have to do it the hard way. No, Ma. No, I won't. If we start shooting, they'll slaughter us.
gutless little punk. Start shooting, or I'll slaughter you. Okay, Mom. Okay. <laughs> This was a fight to the finish. All four knew it. The agents couldn't retreat if they wanted to. softened. She became like a normal mother. A tenderness, a real sorrow, showed through the callous of viciousness. So came to an end the bloody career of Ma Barker and her sons. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin. FBI agents have just closed in on the Barker hideout at Lake Weir, Florida. Culminating oh. many months of investigation. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. Federal agencies. Calls to surrender were ignored, and a hail of machine gun fire greeted the FBI agents. The officers returned the fire, and in the exchange, both Ma Barker and her son Fred were killed. Miraculously, Both killed. none of the agents. Come on, Fred. The FBI stated that Alvin Carpus is now the only member of the vicious gang still at large, and his arrest is expected at any time. Turn it off. Stay tuned to this. Turn it off. For I'll kill him for this. Shooting down an innocent old lady. With my new face, I'll gun him down. Doc! Doc, come in here! What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. I want to see my new face. Well, they shouldn't come off for a couple more days. No! Shirley, get the scissors. Hell, you got to give it a chance to heal properly. Before I'm finished, every G-man in the country will run like a rabbit when he hears my name. With my new face, I'm a cinch! What's wrong? Shirley, hold up that mirror. Can't believe it. It's the same. Nothing's changed. It's 
Just the same. You stupid, thick-headed, bungling, fat-headed whack! Is this what you put me through weeks of misery for? Maybe the fingerprints. Yeah. Yeah. Cut them off. Cut them off! Come on. I'm, I'm hurting now. They're the same. Nothing's changed. Not my face, my fingerprints, my future. It's just the same. Al, Al, I did my best. And your last. I'm going to kill you. No! No! Uh. Uh. His girlfriend and John Hamilton had planned to meet Dillinger in a western city, but another appointment interfered. Dillinger was brought back to the Lake County Jail at Crown Point, Indiana. Among his visitors was his girlfriend, and she brought him more than words of sympathy. Van Meter and Hamilton have it planned. They'll spring you when they take you to court. I've got a better idea. But it works, so I'll have to thank my old man for teaching me the wood. <sighs> Dillinger's plan was simple. He began to whittle a gun from a block of wood. Now, this normally would appear to be child's play. Not with Dillinger. With this desperado, it was deadly serious work. An ingenious scheme to cheat the law. It was slow, tedious labor. He had to be on the alert. Guards checked his cell regularly. How he obtained the block of wood and the knife, especially the knife, never has been learned. Dillinger had fashioned the block of wood into the shape of a pistol, but it was still Obviously, only a wooden gun. Dillinger found the answer. He used shoe polish to blacken it, completing its likeness to a real weapon. At last, the pistol was ready for use at the right time. Dillinger found the exact moment. His boundless nerve and phony gun created one of the most daring jailbreaks in modern history. Went back to your cot and down on your face. Sure. What's for child? Stu? Again? That's that cook that ought to be, huh? That's fine. Go ahead, shoot. Be a hero and your friend dies. Switch it around, butt first. Hurry up. Now you lie face down. Come on. Get in here. Come on. Keys. I have a souvenir from John Dillinger. After his sensational escape, Dillinger joined an old friend, Homer Van Meter. For odd jobs, they used a hero-worshipping small-timer named Tony Malento. Got any hardware yet? No, not yet. I figured on tapping Benny the Frog. He usually keeps a nice line of rods in the back end of the pawn shop. Rods? Now you're talking small, John. Look, uh, what do you stick up with these? Grocery stores, gas stations? 
The guy who gets jobs we're going after, you need artillery. Artillery? Yeah, the works. Machine guns, automatic rifles, shotguns, maybe grenades. Where the devil are we going to get hold of stuff like that? From the police warehouse. Oh, but did you go stir bug after you got out? I, uh, I've been busy while I waited for you, John. I got a brand new jail lined up in Peru, Indiana. The jail? Now, now, wait a minute. Don't get excited. This jail has a beautiful new arsenal, just loaded with goodies. What exactly, I don't know, but I'll find out tomorrow, along with a complete layout. How? You just uh, walk in and say, here I am, show me around. Exactly. <laughs> hey, John, look. <laughs> hey, these are for me, Homer. Have two. They're cheap. All right. You got drums for these? Yeah, they're in the sack. Uh, bulletproof vest? No. No, they're too bulky and too heavy. Besides, those are for yellow bellies. Say, uh, maybe we ought to take one for Tony. Want anything else? I don't no. think so. You got ammo? It's in here. Now, don't worry, Chief. We'll give it back to you. A slug at a time. With this arsenal, Dillinger and Van Meter plunged deep into crime. Policemen were too well aware of the murderous pair who never hesitated to trade slugs for money. Well, a little better than 20 grand each. Not bad, huh? Yeah, not bad at all. It'll buy a heap of living. I think I'll put my order in for some. You leaving? Yeah, I'm leaving. What about me? I drove the getaway car. Where's my cut? Oh, uh... Payment in full. A hundred bucks? Huh. If you were Homer's idea, you let him keep you and spend money. Say that's right. Here's another hundred. Don't buy yourself a big flashy car, huh? <laughs> Thanks. Well, well, good luck. You take care of yourself, hmm? You bet. And if you need me, you, you know how to find me. Right. The FBI opened an SMV file on Dillinger. And everyone in the Bureau knew the file would close only when Dillinger was dead. After his escape, Dillinger went back into business. Big business. Successful business. So successful, it enraged a whole country. In St. Paul, Dillinger and Van Meter shot their way out of a police trap. But Dillinger was wounded. After treatment by a gang doctor, Dillinger and his friends headed north into Wisconsin, looking for a place to lie low while his wounds healed. Little Bohemia. An isolated and little patronized resort. It seemed to be perfect. So Dillinger took over. There's only a little money in the register. That's all I have. You can take it. That's mighty generous. Did you say your name was? Arthur. Arthur Trosser. Well, Arthur, if it's all the money you have, you better not give it away. But, uh, you got yeah. a telephone around here? Yes, over there. Call to John Hamilton, tell him to come up. We found a home. Well, John, not a soul around. I told you that. I told you it's out of season. The lodge is closed, all except the bar. I run that myself. Just keep quiet. Hmm? I won't keep quiet. This is my. <coughs> Talks a lot, doesn't he? Yeah. One of us will have to keep an eye on him. Night and day, like a coat of paint. If he sneezes, there'll be one of us right there to say Gesundheit. Night and day. How about ten to one he snores? Turn off the faucet, Chubby. Go fix us a drink. We're here to enjoy ourselves. Right. Yeah, well, that's fine. Mm-hmm. What a day. Oh, we'll see you then. Kicking me around, shoving me in my own place of business, slapping me. I'd like a penny his ears back. Who does he think he is anyway, John Dillinger? <laughs> I imagine so. That's his name.
Then you're... Homer Van Meter. And... Babyface Nelson. Please, may I write a letter before you kill me? Kill you? So what do you think we are, homicidal maniacs? We never kill anyone except in the line of duty, are we? No, no. You just dry those tears. You'll be a good host for a couple of weeks, and when we leave, you'll not only be alive, but you'll have some of that folded money to remember us by. John Hamilton had accepted the invitation. Friends of Arthur Trosser also occasionally dropped in. Believe me, Ham, it's sure good to see you. How do you feel? Holy. <laughs> well, the ventilation we've got, we sure won't mind the heat. Uh, honey, it's so hard. You look a bit peaked. I'm off my food. A lot of guests for the off season. Where are they from? From the city. Who and what? The Jim Friendly. He better stay that way. He has a little horse ranch over in Blue Valley. And a nice place, too. He has trees, beautiful creek, all filled with trout. You'd like it, Mr. Nelson. It makes a man feel young just to sit by Jim's creek and see one of the new coats come down to get a drink. All knock-kneed and wobbly. But tossing his head... Did I ask you for a nature lesson? All of a sudden, you're full of gab. Why? I guess I talk a lot about things I like. What are you doing back there? Nothing, Mr. Nelson, nothing. Give me some cigs. Want some relief? I sure do. Nature boy is all yours. Arthur, fix me something sweet and cool, huh? Yes, sir, Mr. Van Meter. I'll make you a special. Not too special. You'll have to drink some first. Can I use this to cut the lemon? Why, sure, Arthur. I trust you. You can, Mr. Van Meter. You can. I'm not going to do anything foolish. I'm no better than that. Some fellas might try to act up and be smart, but... My mother didn't raise no foolish children. Uh, hand me the newspaper, will you? I want to see what's going on in the world. Arthur Trosser was afraid of Dillinger. But then, so was the whole nation. And in spite of his fears, Arthur smuggled out a tip to the FBI. Arthur's friend came back. This was Arthur's one chance. He prayed silently as he planted the cigarette package containing the note for help. Caught in this act, death was certain. The friend was unaware of the explosive message he carried. From Wisconsin came words, flashing electronic words, urgent words, to the police, to the FBI, to the men who stand between you and the killers came the word, one word, Dillinger. The word was received. Agents put down their pencils and picked up guns. Hurry, no time to call home. At home, the agents' wives start to worry. Some of them start to pray. It's all they can do. Their husbands don't belong to them now. They're G-men, cops, and a cop killer is loose. It's fighting you, woman. This. You've got the FBI heat on you, John. You're getting too popular. That makes us all too popular. So if you don't mind, I'm cutting out of here tomorrow. Yeah. Too late. The FBI was there. The trap was closing. There'll be more cops on the way. We're gonna blast out now. I'll get my bag. There's no time. Well, let it go. 
Wait a minute. I'm... He's the only one going to tip the cops. Where is he? Let it go, John. We got to move. Go on. Dillinger and Van Meter did chop their way out in the break with the getaway car. Their guns spewed streams of lead as a cover. Despite the steady return fire of the officers, Dillinger and Van Meter reached the car and made good a desperate getaway again. The FBI crossed out one member of the gang. Hamilton, trying a different exit from his partners, was cut down. Van Meter knew that FBI heat was on. An agent had been killed in the escape. He figured his best chance was to flee the country. This would take months. Van Meter, who didn't trust banks, knew right where to dig up a supply. It had been planted for a rainy day. Systematic savings, Tony. An umbrella for a rainy day. All right, Homer. Drop the artillery. Easy. You need some nerve tonic, Tony. With all this gold, I can buy it. You once were. Now you're nothing. It's my turn to be a big shot. I'll kill you for this. Through an informer, Van Meter was traced to St. Paul. Figuring he would seek means of a quick getaway, a trap was baited. A souped-up car was advertised for quick sale. Van Meter answered, but was stalled. Told to return at 4 o'clock when the owner would be there. Our agents had two hours to spring the trap. Okay, I'll be back at 4. It'll just give me time to see an old friend. Oh, uh, be sure and have the owner bring the papers with him. I don't want any delay. I may be in a hurry. Oh, yes, I'll take care of everything. Every criminal has certain peculiar traits that you can count on. Van Meter had sent word out that he would get Tony Malento, and we knew he'd keep his word. Elsewhere in St. Paul was a man who should have been more worried, Tony Malento. Hi, Pops. What's happening? Ain't nothing to shake it, man. Everything's cool. What's your hold? I'm clean, man. How about leaning on these a little? All right, Dad, but I'm working on the champ now. Crazy. Be right with you, man. Easy come, easy go, huh, Tony? Yeah. Where? Hiya, big shot. Where have you been? I've got something for you. Don't reach for that. Any messages? Don't. Better call a cop. It's been a murder. Tyler and his fellow officers closed in to complete their strategy. They were determined not to miss this cop killer again. Van Meter was wanted, dead, or alive. And there wasn't much time. I brought him inside, just like you said. Good. You stay here until he shows up. When he does, get back inside. If there's any shooting, duck out of sight. And there will be if he shows up. I will. not here yet. Why not? It's after four o'clock. Well, I, I called, but, but he wasn't in. But, but, but I left word. Hey, look, why you got the hood up? Something wrong with this heap? No, not a thing. I just want to check it be real good shape. I'll, I'll call him again. Whatever. I'll go with you.
Stay right where you are. Yes, yes. Scratch. One public enemy. Well, there's Homer Van Meter. A few seconds ago, he was a live killer, feared by dozens of states. Now he's so much garbage. A dog barked, and a mad dog was loose again. But where do you go when you're public enemy number one? Where do you get help? Buy it? No, even the underworld hideouts were not open to Dillinger. Friends? Yes, that was the answer. But Dillinger's friends were getting fewer by the day. Hamilton had died in the escape from Little Bohemia. Now Van Meter was dead. Dillinger thought of other friends. Nelson, Tommy Carroll, Pierpont, Mackley, Youngblood. They'd help him. Only they were dead, too. Then Dillinger remembered Mildred Jones. She'd helped him in the past. She would again. She had to. I warned you once, John, I don't like muscle, especially not yours. I don't care what you like or don't like. I'm using your apartment for a while. Why? I need a new face. I'm going to get it right here. The last resort. Change the face, the fingerprints, make yourself a new man, one the cops don't know about. But Dillinger was wrong. We did know. Mildred Johns had come to the FBI. She came to talk. She stayed to help. You want me to put the finger on John Dillinger for you? I don't know. I like living. Everybody does. Including the people Dillinger will kill if we don't get to him first. You say he has a new face. We don't know that face. You do. All right. John's taking me to a matinee this afternoon. The Biograph Theater on Lincoln Avenue. You will know me. I'll be the one in the red dress. Mildred kept her promise. She appeared at the theater with a friend. The man bought the tickets, and Mildred, trying to locate the agents, gave the signal. Dillinger wasn't suspicious, though a cordon had drawn tight. A check was made with the girl in the box office. She said the show would end at 4.20. It was now 2. Two hours and 20 minutes to wait. A long wait when you know someone may die. Plans were gone over again. Hope was that the girl could move away from Dillinger out of the line of fire. This had to be the end of Dillinger. The agents took their prearranged posts. Nervously, watches were checked and checked again. Two hours and 20 minutes is a long time.
The show was over. The audience began moving out of the theater towards a new drama. It was exactly 4.20. This was it. The agents were hoping that Dillinger would come out by himself, making it less dangerous for bystanders. Mildred and Dillinger came out, keeping Destiny's date. Oh, excuse me, John. I have to powder my nose. I'll be right out. Luckily, she managed to leave him as planned. Dillinger was alone. It was time to move. This had to be it. FBI, Dillinger. Don't move! <laughs> Dillinger was dead. End of a tough guy. End of public enemy number one. Alvin Karpus. Now we've got a new public enemy number one. Chief said get him. You know, he's wily, but old Creepy has a weakness they all have. Yeah, he's got three loves. Fishing, dames, and more than anything else, machine guns. Baxter called on Paula, knowing if there was anyone with whom Carpus might maintain an old friendship, it would be Paula. And this shapely blonde knew Baxter as a well-heeled hood from the West Coast. She liked money and exciting people, if they were men. If Paula thought there was a payoff coming, she would be free with information. Wait a minute. Well, what do you know? The hot shot from L.A. is back. Hiya, baby. Hey, give a girl a chance. You're glad to see me, baby? Mm-hmm. Paula's been bored. I need help, Paula. I, uh, got me a big deal set up. Uh-huh, big deal. Yeah, real big. And I got a contact creepy. Carpet? He's the number one. I know, I still want him. You and the G-men. Don't mention them and me in the same breath. You get me to Creepy and I got something real sweet for all of us. I haven't seen him. I don't like fish. You mean he's fishing with all this heat on him? Sure. Where? I don't. He did say that if business got bad, he was going to fish in one certain place if it was the last thing he ever did. It was... It was the Gulf. The Gulf of Mexico. That's a lot of water. Where in the Gulf? Oh, I don't know. I had checked all the spots along the Gulf from St. Petersburg to New Orleans to Galveston. Suddenly, fishing was good. Get my knife out of the tackle box, honey. Give me the key. You got it. I gave it to you. Take a look and tell me if you see what I see. Finally. Long last. I don't think Carpus knows us by sight. Let's ease up and get the drop. I hope it works. Oh, that's very right. What's wrong? Those two guys coming down the pier. Sightseers. Uh-uh, cops. I can smell them a mile. Give me the key. I haven't got it. My gun's in this. I gotta break it open. He spotted us. I'm gonna ease down the pier. If they're cops, they'll follow. If they follow, I run. But there's no place to run to. After they pass you, I'll duck under the pier, grab a rowboat. You rent a speedboat, circle out and pick me up. They can do the same thing. If you'll have five minutes head start, that's enough. You get the girl.
Perfect! Come back or I'll fire! No, I want him alive. <laughs> Wanting Karpus alive almost cost me my life. But a G-man isn't trained to give up. And if Karpus could take it, so could I. My FBI training and physical fitness won out. Karpus didn't have the stamina. He gave up. We had Mr. Public Enemy Number One begging to stay alive. All his murderous predecessors had learned the hard way that the final sentence is sudden death. Guns don't argue. And so for Alvin Karpus, murderer and hoodlum, the long trail stained with the blood of his many victims had run out. Like Bonnie Parker, Clyde Barrow, Ma Barker, Fred Barker, Van Meter, Dillinger, and many others, his infamous crimes had reached an end, a dead end closed by the FBI. And as to these men, the men who pledged to defend the right, protect the weak, aid the distressed and uphold the law, this picture has been dedicated.